the talk, excellent talk Kim gave really amounts to an introduction to my talk. <laughs> and so now I have to comment on the introduction to my talk. <laughs> okay. and so I've persuaded the organizers that to simplify matters, uh, I'll just give my talk. <laughs> um, I thought uh, Kim gave an excellent uh, presentation that had two components. The one is the presentation of some data. And the other one was the interpretation of the data in terms of some models. And I, I want to make a very clear distinction between these two. And, and um, I, I greatly admire her for that, that island looked very inviting and so on. I suspect it's inviting for an hour or two. <laughs> and, 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 uh, so we shouldn't underestimate the effort and courage what's gone there. And I, I just briefly want to make a case that we have no choice. I mean, those people in the business of climate model development, uh, we want to make forecasts and we need data. And I'm going to argue that we have no choice but to get interested in paleoclimate data. And the, our best success, we're trying to predict El Nino, and she discussed those cases, and then we try to predict uh, global warming. Our biggest success by far has been weather forecasting. And weather forecasting, you know, this morning I turned on the radio for the news and a million people have been told to evacuate their homes uh, down in the Gulf of Mexico. A hurricane is coming. And you, you don't have to go back very far. Certainly the Second World War, even subsequent to that, there were admirals out in the Pacific uh, deciding not to pay any attention to meteorologists' message that... Uh, hurricane or typhoon is coming. I mean, these people don't know what they're talking about. And, you know, many ships have been destroyed. And it's amazing that uh, Jeb Bush, the president's brother, uh, when the meteorologists predict uh, hurricanes now, he orders evacuation. When the meteorologists predict global warming, he pays no attention. <laughs> so our goal should be to be where the meteorologists are. Uh, meteorology, uh, weather forecasting today is, is a source of very reliable information. It's big business. People pay attention. Uh, if you go back, uh, th that's the only world Kim is aware of. If you go back to my world, uh, uh, weather forecasting in the 1670s was a kind of entertainment on TV. It was so inaccurate. And if you go back even further, it was a kind of witchcraft. And if you doubt that, this is a little passage from a uh, novel of Thomas Hardy. But I, I like the, his method for predicting. He, he's asked to predict what the end of August will be like. And it says, by the sun, the moon, the stars, by the clouds, the winds, the trees, and the grass. Candle flames, swallows, the smell of herbs, and so on. The last fortnight in August will be rain and tempest. And it turns out he's completely wrong. <laughs> and it, it, it's ruined. Uh, uh, this fellow, Enchard, had some indiscretion in his youth. When this scene arrives, uh, he needs money in a hurry. He goes into the futures commodities market. He needs this forecast, and his ruin is, is sealed. And, and we're in the same situation, I suppose. People are coming to us for forecasts, and we hope we'll do better. Uh, if, if we ask why did weather forecasting succeed, I would argue there were three components. A, they have measurements that describe. Measurements are key. Uh, Secondly, and this is critical, they have a hierarchy of models. They don't just have one fancy big GCM that's as complicated and realistic as can be. The absolutely critical was a hierarchy. Even to discuss the output from a GCM, if it goes bad, you need to revert to much simpler models. And it started ages ago and when the physicists introduced the concept of energy. The meteorologists immediately capitalized on that in the 1860s. And they realized that what clouds represent is one form of energy being converted into another, as latent heat into sensible heat. And uh, for a while, there was a fellow SP called uh, Storm King. Uh, it was in the 1860s, and he actually turned his, you know, he was the first person to realize how a storm works. People realized low pressure is associated with bad weather, I had no idea why. And he realized if you had low pressure, the air will rise, that uh, convection will occur, and so he, he became a big public figure, and in the 1860s he proposed if there's droughts on the east coast, what we need is a forest, plant a forest from the Gulf of Mexico to the Great Lakes. And whenever you need rain, you burn part of it. 
<laughs> this will create convection, and when it's rained enough, you stop. <laughs> and the, the only way, this was actually discussed in Congress, and the only way it, it didn't pass is the southern states thought that the northern states would have too much power on their weather <laughs> and could give them rain when they didn't want it. So anyway, the, the, this went nowhere, it was Mr. Espy. Uh, then much later along came baroclinic instability theory, and it, it's incredibly uh, simple and straightforward. Uh, you, you could take a little annulus, the donut shaped thing, put water in it, warm the poles, cool the, uh, warm the equator, cool the poles. And if you make that gradient too big, you spontaneously get weather. So for the first time, we actually had an explanation for why there is weather. It's not obvious why there is weather. Sunlight is the same from today to tomorrow. Why is the weather so completely different often from one day to the next? And this remarkably simple model explained that. And it's still essential if people want to understand a change in weather over Aspen. Tomorrow they look at the weather map and look at vertical shear and north-south. All these concepts come from these ones. And by the 60s we had a good understanding of weather. It took something like another 20, 30 years to translate that into an ability to predict the weather. And the reason was that the, the phenomena we deal with don't repeat themselves. And so you can tune your model, there's all sorts of tuning parameters, to get weather on some particular day right. But to get weather right, different types of weather day after day, you need to see many, many, you need many, many tests. And it took it right into the 1980s, 90s, and it involved a continual interplay between A and B. Like a, a mountain drag is a big thing in the weather forecasting models. Mountain drag, you study with a very idealized model, you have some Gaussian bump, you have flow, you have gravity waves, some of them break and so on. So on the basis of very simple models, highly idealized, you get results that can be used in the very complex models. So to me, this is a wonderful model of uh, how success has been achieved. It requires all these elements. You need the measurements continuously. You need people developing simple models, constantly testing. And you need these large models subject to test. So if we turn to El Nino, we can ask, uh, where are we today? And I will say we have available measurements that describe only a generic El Nino. Okay, well, we haven't really, I mean, most people in this room probably heard of El Nino first in 97. Things have been around forever, but we just didn't have measurements. So, so at the moment, our measurements are meager. We have really idealized models, somewhat the counterpart of baroclinic instability theory, that can explain to us most of those uh, aspects of El Nino, the spatial scale, the relation between wind and sea surface temperature and so forth. Uh, however, I would submit we do not have any models capable of predicting El Nino, uh, contrary to what you may read in the literature or newspapers. Uh, uh, the proof is very simple. Uh, each and every El Nino that has so far occurred has surprised us. Right? In 82, nobody <laughs> It, there was a group discussing a program to study El Nino, a big thing happened in Princeton. At the time, nobody was aware that the biggest event of the century was underway. The, subsequently, 92, it simply went on and on, persisted forever. Nobody anticipated that. Nobody in 97 anticipated the intensity. Uh, 2004, papers are now coming out telling you in retrospect what had happened in 2004. It's still a surprise. I think Noah put out a El Nino warning at some point, then retracted the El Nino warning. <laughs> and I don't know if they changed their mind again, but anyway, uh, and the reason is we simply haven't seen enough realizations. Uh, Hans von Storch was telling me that he didn't look at the El Nino business for a while, then he came back, it was 10 years later, he was writing some report on models, he said you should look at El Nino models, usually it's the big success story. And uh, to his dismay, he couldn't find much progress. Uh, my advice to Answers, patience, patience, wait 40, 50 years. <laughs> uh, the thing has the time scale of four or five years. So I, I, don't, I don't know about you, I don't expect to be around 40, 50 years. So I'm going to pay attention to Kim. <laughs> okay, we have no choice. We either wait a long time and see many realizations, or we pay attention to the paleo. What I've said here can also be said about the global warming thing, that we could go ahead and We've developed models that are extremely good at reproducing the climate of today. Uh, that, that's a little bit like developing a weather prediction model that gets today right. There's no guarantee it's going to work for any other day. 
I, I don't see why we have much confidence in these models in some other climate state. And again, the models need tests. And I'm going to make a case for that. And the tests I would submit would be paleo data. We have no choice but to get involved in paleo data. So then I had some other comments on Kim's stuff. I, I won't really go through it. Uh, let me just say, uh, Kim and I disagree on a few things. Uh, I feel our understanding of El Nino at the moment is the following, that it's uh, the phenomena <coughs> can't really be separated from La Nina, its oscillation, it's a natural mode of the system. Uh, to, to ask why El Nino occurs is the same as asking why a pendulum swings back and forth. There's no particular point in asking that. You can ask what are the factors that determine the period of the pendulum. And so you can ask what is the background state that determines the properties of this oscillation, its time scale, its spatial structure, and so on. And we have some information on that. Uh, weak non-linearities come into play. It's, it's not B or C. When you look at your record and you ask, you, you had some change in properties of your linear that occurred abruptly, somewhere you wrote that it's this and it's not that. Uh, I don't think, it's not either or. Uh, you have, even if you have a chaotic system that behaves this way and it suddenly behaves this way, you can do a linear stability analysis about this state and about that state and try to find out what was the difference that caused this. So you can actually go to the keynes ebiak model and try to analyze why it is that it sometimes behaves this way and some other time that way. It, it, I don't think it's a choice between these. They're both at play. And then to complicate matters even more, there's lots of noise around. And in, in principle, it's, it's quite possible that deterministic predictions of El Nino may not be possible. It, it, it's a reality. The funding agencies don't want to hear about the fund people to predict the thing. But it's quite possible because of random noise. I would submit that 97, El Nino, even in retrospect, you cannot predict it unless you knew that there were westerly wind bursts that were going to come along at just the right phase. It's a bit of pendulum swinging. If it's going this way and you kick it, you get a huge amplitude. If it's coming this way, you kick it, you get nothing. But unless you had a priori information that this kick is coming along, you can't make a prediction. So at best, we may be capable only of uh, probabilistic predictions. Uh, what happened in 97, in June 97, people did make predictions, say California was going to have pouring rain in December, January. They were absolutely right. And the reason simply the time scale of evolution of this thing is such that, that, uh, that it, it takes 6, 12 months for a linear to go from beginning to end. Once it's grown to a certain stage, you can anticipate fairly confidently what will happen next. So the success in 97 had nothing to do with the models. It had to do with the measurements. We had measurements in place. We could see the thing growing. Once it had grown to a certain stage, it was fairly certain to go beyond that. So at this point, uh, let me just see. Uh, OK, that was my summary for, those were my comments on Kim's talk. and in. in you can read those. Well, what I want to do next is go on. She's, uh, I've so far commented only on part of her talk. She then on, also spoke about uh, changes in the mean state, uh, what can cause those. So I want to chat about that because that's actually, how do I close this and open something else? This one. Yes. Okay, so. Uh, my talk is, this is, you know, 8.30 tomorrow morning, <laughs> uh, listening to a talk about overlooked uh, mechanisms for rapid climate change. Uh, since Kim started speaking about that, I'll continue. Uh, uh, sea surface temperature change of this type has a huge impact on the climate locally and globally. And the reason is very obvious. Uh, that sea surface temperature, that's rainfall, there's almost a perfect correlation in the tropics. It rains heavily wherever the water is warm, and it's dry in uh, usually low-level stratus clouds wherever the water is cold. If you change this SST pattern, this changes, dramatic changes in the location of the cumulus clouds and so on. So we have clear evidence from El Nino that a change in sea surface temperature patterns from there to there can have a dramatic impact on climate locally and global. We don't call this change a rapid climate change because it's part of a continual fluctuation. It doesn't last very long. These conditions at their peak last for a month or two, and then they drift back to this, back and forth. So it's because of the time scale that we don't consider this a rapid climate change. So what I want to propose this overlooked mechanism is 99% of the papers about El Nino 
has to do with uh, this mechanism. Uh, this is the thermocline along the equator west to east. And all you have to do to induce El Nino is to move the thermocline up and down in, in this manner. And uh, what it's completely adiabatic. And 99% uh, of the papers have to do with this phenomenon. Uh, the overlooked phenomenon I want to speak about is this one, where the, we can induce changes in the thermocline of this type. And physically, this would be an entirely different mechanism. Uh, this one is diabetic. And uh, notice the impact on sea surface temperature will be quite similar to this, because over in the Western Pacific, moving the thermocline up and down doesn't do much to the sea surface temperatures, and really only the east that matters. So what I want to talk about in, uh, is this as an um, overlooked mechanism for climate, uh, for rapid climate change. The time scale for this is going to be quite a bit longer than this. It's going to be on the order of decades. Uh, if you ask uh, you know, what are the mechanisms that control this type of El Nino, and I, I'm going to, dis to distinguish it from this, I'll refer to it as El Grande, which gives the impression that I spend a lot of time in Starbucks. <laughs> 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 Uh, if you ask uh, what can cause El Grande, it's really equivalent to asking why is the ocean so cold. That the ocean today has remarkably little warm water. It has a very shallow thermocline. And even if you go to the warm western equatorial Pacific and take the vertical average of temperature, it's barely above freezing. And this question has intrigued people since the 1700s. There's a letter in the Proceedings of the Royal Society from a captain on the ship of West Africa. And he reports that when he lowers a bucket across the side of the ship, he can easily uh, find cold water. He was in sweltering latitudes. And he points out it was very pleasant for the captain's bath and for keeping the wine cool. And he asked the Royal Society to provide an explanation why is there so much cold water so close to the surface. Well, it's 200 years later, and we're still debating this question. <laughs> And we have two schools of thought. Uh, quite clearly, to maintain this thermal structure, the ocean has to move. Right? It must be a circulation. And so it's long been realized that the most obvious source for this cold water must be high latitudes. And the one school of thought, then, is the much beloved and cherished thermohaline circulation, is that where the water sinks is it's not very symmetrical. Something over there, none sink in the none things in the North Pacific and then some around here. Anyway, this picture everybody knows. It's even in the movies now. And the reason some people are skeptical of it is that we may know where the water sinks, but we don't really know where the water comes back up. Where the water comes back up, you would require to warm it up. You need some diffusion, some turbulent mixing. And when people go and measure, they measure very small turbulent diffusion. And, uh, Somebody, a fellow Danny Sigmund, who was a student at Woodsell, tells me a story that Wally Broker convened a meeting in Woodsell to discuss this thermo haline. Must have been in the late 1980s. And at some point, a hooded character with a fork ran in to the front of the, the room and wrote on the board uh, kappa equal to zero and ran out again. <laughs> and that was Hank Stommel. <laughs> and uh, these require big kappa, big diffusion. You need diffusion. The argument here is that you maintain the very shallow thermocline by inhibiting downward diffusion with upwelling of cold water. And if you put in some numbers, you get a very large value for kappa. And Stommel is the opinion kappa is far, far smaller than these theories would demand. So off went Tommel and he persuaded Bedlarsky, Lloyd, and some people to study something called a ventilated thermocline, where you assume that kappa is zero. And then the focus there is entirely on the wind driven circulation. And what they in effect did was to convert Tommel's model for the Gulf Stream. Everybody knows about Western Drive circulation and how the curl of the wind intensifies that. He gave it the third dimension, vertical. And you can see this shows the depth of a water parcel. Uh, circulating in this gyre. You can see here it's at the surface. It goes down, doesn't go very deep, 250 meters, comes back up ultimately. Some of it goes to the equator, comes back at the equator. So you, you have this wind driven. So there are uh, this whole books. There's a book by Pidlowski devoted to this. And there are movies devoted to this. The <laughs> and uh, uh, Twain don't really meet. These communities don't interact that much. Uh, the, at this meeting, I gather from the agenda. We're going to have lots of talks about this. Uh, nobody mentions this, but these two things are actually inseparable. 
the, you cannot, uh, in, implicit in all the ventilated thermocline theories is a, a deep circulation. It doesn't tell you anything about what happens lower than 300 meters or so. So you still need this theory. And so what's actually needed is some marriage of these two things. And uh, the, the incompleteness of this part usually shows up in the theories as a need to specify the ocean stratification along the eastern coast. Uh, in, in all the ventilated thermocline theories, you have to specify how density varies with depth along the eastern coast of the ocean basin. Alternatively, in the absence of any winds, these models will have a stratification. There'll be a warm surface layer in a cold, deep ocean. And it's assumed that you are, it, you are told uh, or that some unspecified processes determine that stratification. And those unspecified processes are really these ones. So there's actually a need to marry these two things. Uh, universe of possibilities here. No, 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 I, I'm just, I'm comparing myself to 99% of the literature. <laughs> there, there are in, and we'll come later on. Uh, one of my big, never mind, we'll come later on to that issue. <laughs> Uh, another way of looking at this thing is in, in the wind-driven circular, right, in, in the deep thermohaline theories, you assume that upwelling band balances diffusion. As I mentioned, you get in trouble with kappa. It has to be too big, bigger than measured. The other theory is if you ask them what maintains the water, say, here at 18 degrees centigrade, instead of, instead of saying it's this balance, they say there's a continual circulation of this type. Uh, so there's this wind. And the main point I want to make is that both these components could be described as conveyor belts. Uh, both are meridional overturning circulations. The one is very shallow, and we don't invoke uh, salinity to force the water down. It could be the wind, it's called subduction. And the other one is presumably thermohaline. But I, I want to specify, uh, emphasize that both of them involve meridional overturnings. And uh, recently, we've been looking into the matter, and uh, some students, Giulio Boccoletti, some of you may know, uh, it turns out if you want to marry these two things, what is the missing constraint that will close the ventilator thermocline theories? And Julia's contribution to say it's the constraint of a balanced heat budget for the ocean. Uh, th this is where the ocean gains most of its heat, and this is where it loses the heat. And in the state of equilibrium, if you integrate this, it should be zero, the net heat flux across the surface. So the ocean should gain as much heat as it loses. But uh, there's an asymmetry, the loss of heat depends strongly on atmospheric conditions. Uh, this is co very cold air coming in winter off continents over the warm ocean, it extracts a lot of heat from the ocean. So the atmosphere to a large extent dictates how much heat the ocean loses. On the other hand, the ocean dictates how much heat it gains. Uh, the thermocline is very shallow in the Eastern Pacific so that cold water comes to the surface and the ocean gains a large amount of heat. Uh, during El Nino when the thermocline goes down, this goes down. So you can do an experiment. Suppose you shut off the loss of heat for some reason, global warming or whatever. Then initially the tropics will not know. Heat accumulates, but it's no longer lost. And the net amount of warm water will accumulate. And the net result will be a deepening of the thermocline. So if you ask, the, the answer to why is the thermocline so shallow to the ship captain who in the 1700s wrote to the Royal Society, the answer is that the ocean is losing so much heat in high latitudes that to gain a, a corresponding amount of heat in the tropics, the thermocline has to be very shallow. And if we should change to some other world where the ocean loses much less heat, the thermocline could be much deeper and so forth. And then we did a number of experiments and simple models to illustrate that. Uh, so th these are the key things to try and remember, that if you reduce the heat loss in high latitudes, then you will deepen the thermocline in the tropics. If you will increase the heat loss in high latitudes, you will show the thermocline. So, so offhand, say during a glacial maximum, it interests Dick a lot. If the world were to lose a lot of heat in high latitudes during a glacial maximum, the thermocline has to be very shallow. And heat transport pole would actually increase uh, if these arguments were valid and if that were the case. On the other hand, in a warm world, it's the opposite direction. So we did our experiments and you can, since it's a material overturning, you can influence the thermal structure not only by changing heat loss in high latitudes, also pouring fresh water, a completely independent mechanism, because you then make the water so buoyant it won't sink. And this experiment that uh, Fedorov did, this is heat transport 
And this is pouring increasing amounts of fresh water onto this basin. This shows you what happens at different points. And the result is completely different from the, what the meridional overturning people usually tell you. They'll tell you about ice and places like Hamburg and so on. Here instead you'll induce a permanent El Nino. You, sh you shrink the region where the ocean gains heat as you do this. Okay, so this overlook mechanism has a completely different manifestation from uh, shutting down the thermohaline. Uh, if you do it periodically, clearly there's some adjustment time for the ocean to have a balanced heat budget. So if you change the heat, here we did an experiment where we change the heat loss periodically. If you do it very rapidly, the gray line, there's almost no response in the tropics. If you do it very slowly, it is exactly almost out of phase. Okay. So this would be a mechanism for, say, the cadal variations in low latitudes. Uh, Kim showed some results where the properties of El Nino will change. It could be because the thermocline moved up and down. It could be in response to what's happening in high latitudes. That in high latitudes, if you were to shut down oceanic heat loss, thermocline would go down, El Nino properties would change, and so on. Uh, what do we have now? Okay, so, so in the literature at the moment, there are two bodies of results. There, there's lots that tell you poor fresh water in the North Atlantic and thermohaline shutdowns and so on and so forth. And then at the other extreme, there's a paper by Fedorov that says poor fresh water and high latitudes and you'll induce a permanent El Nino if you overdo it. Uh, who was right? It, it turns out they can both be right. It depends entirely on this parameter camera. It's just one of the many factors. But if you have very highly diffusive ocean, you've biased your model towards the thermohaline part doing most of the heat transport. And in that case, uh, you do the same by having a very coarse resolution model, which necessarily was the case with the climate models initially. They had very coarse resolution for the ocean, say five or 10 degree latitude by longitude. Then of necessity, there's almost no equatorial upwelling and you have very high diffusion. And so you're in the world everybody's familiar with. If you go to the other extreme, you make up extremely small and in the model we could do this, you completely bias the model towards the ventilated thermocline theories. And in that case, the impact is entirely different. So in reality, we could say both contribute, both of these mechanisms. And the, we've looked into this matter. And so we can actually, there's no inconsistency in the literature. It's all a matter of which parameters you choose. And you can either have the results we're going to hear about a lot. Are you going to say something about what controls to? No, no, that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> You're attributing it all to that. I mean, it would seem like you know, one ought to say something about it. Yeah, I'm hoping somebody will. I'm not. <laughs> no, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a critical problem. Well, the present climate model of now realistic tends in the tropics. Says Peter Gent. Well, they're to what they used to. Yeah, I mean, America. Yeah. But, uh, there uh, is this question. They also must balance the observations. From the but yeah. given a changed climate system, how would they change? How would they change? Yes, exactly. That's the question. And ultimately, I mean, you, other turbulence people, can come up and tell us this is how K should. What we ultimately will need is some observations about some other climate, a warm climate in which the thermocline was deep. And I mean, no, that will well, be the ultimate check. But, but you can ask in the modern ocean. What is controlling? Okay, absolutely. And there are observations that could yeah. to suggest yeah. an answer to that. And some of them, of course, implicate the wind field. Yeah. But so, would you assume that K time frame of 100 or 200 years would change dramatically? If, for example, it's controlled by the raised generation of internal waves by the wind field, you can do it within a matter of years. That's could be very fast. Okay. So anyway, the, these are the theoretical results. Let me just say something quickly about, okay, so what, back to Kim's part of the talk. Uh, this is a map of sea surface temperature in the tropics. And if you want to explain the El Nino, if you want to explain why this part periodically gets warm, you start by pointing out that there's a chicken and egg argument between meteorologists and oceanographers. If you ask an oceanographer, why is it colder and warm there? It'll say it's because the winds are blowing westward and the winds pile up the warm water here and expose the cold water over there. And then if you ask a meteorologist why the wind's blowing westward, he will say it's because the sea surface temperatures. It's because the water is warm there and cold there. 
And so the implication from that chicken egg argument is that there are positive feedbacks between the ocean atmosphere. Isn't that just angular momentum conservation of the heated tropics? No, and it, it's special in that you have to have the Coriolis force vanish. Otherwise, the wind wouldn't blow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah but at, at the equator, you could... The Coriolis could, force is zero. Could you have but. a world in which the trades blew toward the east? Well, by definition, those would not be trades. Is there a world... Uh, that's a good question. If you go back to Hadley's papers and they said, uh, you need both westerlies and easterlies to balance momentum. Right. And so on a water covered globe, you would have easterlies in the tropics, even without any gradients. Right. But, yeah. but no, but you wouldn't get the, they'd be very weak in comparison to what you actually observe. Uh, yeah, and, and that's what happened in El Nino, for example, the trades relax enormously. So anyway, my main point was that there are positive feedbacks that come into play. There's a couple of problems. Now, you can ask what limits this feedback. It could run away, and, and, and in fact, sort of runs away until we get the El Nino. So one limit is you can't get the water warmer than 30 degrees C everywhere. At this point, the feedback has to. So in the El Nino business, what limits the feedback is, is that's certainly one mechanism. Another is the delayed response of the ocean to the winds. The response of the atmosphere to a change in sea surface temperature patterns is very quick, days, weeks. The response of the ocean to a change in the winds is much longer, weeks, months. And so this delay, the response of the ocean, is one factor, another factor that will limit this feedback. And the net result is the feedback gives you an oscillation, and that's the southern oscillation between El Nino and La Nina. So if you write on some equations, you have to keep d by dt, you have to keep the time dependence. Uh, people like David Nealon pointed out that there's uh, another problem here. If I take the time average over 50 years, or the last 100 years, the SST pattern has those features, and you have trades. So clearly, the same feedbacks are influencing the trades. It gets back to Carl's question. If you had no gradient, there would be some trades, but the moment you integrate a slight gradient, the trades intensify, which increases the gradient and so forth. So the question is, in the mean state, what controls the, what controls this feed, what limits this feedback? And it turns out to be completely different from the interannual El Nino La Nina, which is the oscillation. Uh, people such as David Leland and uh, uh, Xu at Wisconsin, Xu and Wang, had papers on this different type of S interaction. And what ultimately limits another factor, important one, is the water that rises here is water that's subducted in high latitudes, in you know, the subtropics. So you can't get the water colder than a certain temperature, and this feedback will come to a stop. Right? Because the ultimately, the, the water that rises here, I showed you earlier a picture, sank at some high latitude. Okay, so now we have a new class of S interactions being studied with extremely simple models. And this will get back to Kim's question as to what controls the temperature uh, in the tropics, sea surface temperatures. And uh, Kane and company have argued that if you increase solar radiation, the response over here and over here are completely different. And that you can actually, an increase in the radiation in low latitudes can actually result in colder water and stronger winds. And th the reason they argued was simply that if you, suppose you increase radiation onto the tropics, this part of the world you'll warm up, this part you'll warm up less because of the upwelling. And so you would actually increase the gradient, which will st strengthen the wind and so forth. You'll get that feedback. So uh, we looked into the matter and it turns out this is tells you as a function of mean wind and thermocline depth, how the, the temperature in the eastern equatorial Pacific will respond to increase in solar radiation. Uh, if you're over here, if you have a very shallow thermocline, Keynes argument comes into play. And you can actually get colder temperatures, even though you've increased solar radiation. However, he got into a debate with Manabi, and it got into the pages of science. Manabi will tell you increased solar radiation will warm up the eastern tropical Pacific. And uh, you, all you have to do is begin this parameter range over here, and you'll get the different result. Clearly, if the thermocline is at 1,000 meters, this pattern, that will be quite different, and then you won't get that response. And so there's sort of a continual gradation. But I, I want to emphasize this is 
an example of the, the, the importance of very simple models that can help shed light on much more complicated ones. Quite often the, compli the controversies arise because people are simply dealing with different parameter ranges. It, it's not because the one is the truth and the other one is not the truth. Uh, you can accommodate all of them. Now, the surprising thing, suppose at this stage I ask you how will uh, global warming affect uh, low latitudes? Kane will say, ah, it's going to decrease uh, tropical SSD, but now we will tell you to increase. And Kim had a plot where in most of the IPCC models, it made no change to the properties of El Nino, of the global warming. There were a few that had the cane type result and a few that had the Manabi. And we've gone back to the IPCC models, looked at the result in global warming, and we're absolutely astonished. This is what happens to sea surface temperature patterns along the equator in today's world and in a world with two times CO2. And I find this result quite astonishing because the Eastern Pacific warms up practically as much as the West. And this happens in the majority of the IPCC models. Uh, I can check the ensemble mean also. Yeah, she, she went here for her talk, but she had a talk earlier where she showed a histogram. And there, I think your model is the one that will actually warm up the East more than the West. Right. Uh, well, you, well, you'll give your talk later. <laughs> okay. uh, Kim showed some results of yours. The, anyway, so... so Conclusion, at first I was quite flabbergasted by this. I was expecting on the basis of federal results that you would get a temperature like this, that we'd go towards a permanent El Nino, that we wouldn't get this result. So we have some climate models, the majority of the IPCC, obviously the properties of El Nino in this world will be very different depending on whether you have this profile or a profile like that, or even a profile that goes in the other direction. So at this stage, which of the IPCC results you should pay attention to is not at all obvious. Either you, you can get any result you please. If you want a linear more frequent, there's a model that will suit you. <laughs> if you want it less frequent, there's another model that will suit you. And if you want no change, there are many models. The, so at present, this is the state of affairs, that uh, there are two separate sets of models that simulate S interactions. I can go to the David Nealon and Liu type model. They focus on the climatology. They pay little attention. The big difference is that the people who've been running this type of model bias those models. They, they focus on these tropical air interactions. That's what they want to have important. If there is a change in SST, the atmosphere has to adjust and respond and so forth. Then there's the IPCC type models that give you the previous result. If you ask somebody like Pierre Rayambert or Isaac Eld to explain what's going on here, they start at the top of the atmosphere. They will say that you increase CO2, there's some feedbacks, more water vapor. But the main point is there's almost no change in the albedo of the globe as such in these models. As a result, the radiation balance at the top of the atmosphere doesn't change. And so you, you now you know the temperature that's being radiated out at the top of the atmosphere. Then you go down at adiabatic lapse rate, you get the temperature of the surface. If you increase, there's no blackboard here, but if you increase the... So they, they'll tell you if you have a high tier versus a surface temperature, you have adiabatic lapse rate up to the stratosphere. And the temperature at which you radiate to space will be over here somewhere. And there's a balance at this point. If you put more CO2 into the atmosphere, what you'll get is you still have to have the lapse rate to this. You'll simply move to this point. So the temperature at the top of the atmosphere doesn't change. You go down, you get a new temperature at the bottom, a much higher temperature than you had before. And this is their explanation for what's going on here. So what I find intriguing about this line of reasoning is that it pays very little attention to S interactions. It assumes the atmosphere dictates to the ocean how it should respond. And what's intriguing also, Kim was talking about the thermostat. In these models, there's no limit to how warm the West can get. If they do four times CO2, the West will go from 30 to, well, yeah, it's 29. But I've seen models where it goes up to 40 degrees C. Uh, they see no reason why temperatures, maximum temperatures in the Western Equatorial Pacific 
should be limited. Uh, one thing that happens in a model like this, because you have a gradient, you maintain a Walker circulation. Because you maintain a Walker circulation, there's subsidence of the Eastern Pacific, you maintain stratus clouds. So you have stratus clouds even in this very warm world. Even at the Eastern Pacific, Galapagos temperature may go up to 30 degrees centigrade, you still won't have any rain. You're going to have, in, this is a peculiarity of this model, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but that, that's the way it describes. It's a very different world from the one these other people describe. So now we left the, what I'm engaged in at the moment, we're trying to develop some intermediate model where we can really some parameter, and if we have time, I can go into the details. And I hope to have some parameter that if I tune it one way, I'll reproduce those results. If I tune it some other way, I'll get these results. So again, I don't think there's really an inconsistency. It's just that certain parameters have been tuned. I mean, there's huge numbers of parameters to be tuned in these models, be assured. Uh, so suppose I now create such a model. And I suspect it all has to do with stratus clouds, by the way, how you parameterize those. Suppose I tune a model where I get back the Neelan type result, more solar radiation, and what's likely to happen is the Eastern Pacific warms up, the Western Pacific does not, and you go towards El Nino. On the other hand, if I put the stratus clouds back in and I don't allow them to change, I will get the IPCC model type result. Uh, how do I know which tuning is the right one for future climates? That's really the issue. Which should I believe? And I would submit we have no choice but to go to the paleo data. Now, to go, I've been doing this now for several years. And if you wonder why I'm so gray, it's in part because I got involved in paleo climates. The, it, it, it's a remarkably difficult business, uh, not only because you have to learn a new vocabulary and language and how they find out things, but it then turns out they have a culture completely different from ours. And bridging to that culture is strange. For a start, they only publish in science and nature. And they often publish papers on the basis of measurements at one point. <laughs> so they can, and quite often, those papers contradict each other. Uh, if you want a recent example, uh, go to the New York Times of two weeks ago. Uh, there was a paper in science a few weeks ago that says, during a certain period, the Pliocene the conditions in the tropics corresponded to El Nino. And two months earlier, there was a paper that said it corresponded to La Nina. One of those people must be wrong. <laughs> Not everybody can be right. The Times picked up on this. They called me. I mean, if I'm an anonymous referee, I say, you know, so and so is wrong. Uh, New York Times, so I say, oh, in the world of science, you never know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so at the moment, there's complete confusion. Similarly, last glacial maximum. Ask somebody whether it was El Nino or La Nina in the tropics last glacial maximum. Some will tell you it was El Nino, some will tell you La Nina. All of this is based on precisely one point, most of these things. Somebody, Kutafis, digs into the Galapagos Islands near it. It's a peculiar location, I thought. But anyway, science publish, uh, 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 reviewers okayed it. So you get involved in paleo. I, David Nealon is a good friend of mine. I try to persuade him. Only test for his theories is to get involved in paleo climate, and he assured me, no way. <laughs> and not until they make up their minds, still, <laughs> whether it was El Nino or La Nina. So, or, neither. or neither. So given this kind of worms, what do we do? And the, I would propose that uh, the paleo record is valuable. Is invaluable, uh, <laughs> if used with care. Uh, and the, the trick, I don't know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm sort of putting my confidence in, I've no confidence in a paper based on one point. Okay? And so what I find reassuring is people drill into the seafloor all over the place, and they come up uh, and they measure oxygen 18, it's a measure of global ice volume, and they come up with very similar pictures all around the globe. So I'll put my confidence in pictures of uh, this type. Okay, it's what happened over the last 60 million years. And what happened over the last, and by the way, I find this by far the most persuasive reason for being concerned about global warming. That it seems to me I wouldn't be concerned about global warming. It, it, it's not the result from models or that has me worried. It, it's this fact that we living 
we're on this planet at the most peculiar moment in its long history. You have to take a very long-term view. But what's amazing about this picture is the Milankovitch forcing has basically been the same all the time, and the response has exploded. Yeah, and it all started around, I've blown up the scale here, it all starts around three million years. You can blow up the scale for some other periods, and the Milankovitch is very modest, it's like this. Something peculiar happened, and the world has gone big. And so I would submit our one, we have some... I'm running out of time. We have some speculations as to how some of the results that I just described can help explain what happened around here. Uh, uh, another, uh, uh, when I showed you that sea surface temperature map for today, and I asked you, if I had to ask you, uh, I made the statement we're living in this world at a very special moment in its history. If you were to step outside, what would you look at for confirmation that this is a special moment in the history of the planet? I would say you would go to the Galapagos and find very cold water at a place where sunlight is most intense. Or you would go to California or Peru. It, it's the presence of very cold water in low latitudes that seems to me is, is a surprising feature that has to be explained. The world gets very really excited when El Nino occurs, but El Nino is an obvious state of affairs. It, it's the more common state of affairs that's most remarkable. It's the cold water <laughs> that needs explanation, not the warm water. In, in the normal world, you think the water will be warm. So what's surprising here, these are, again, paleo data from all these cold upwelling zones. And today, we're all familiar with cold water off Southwest Africa, off California, off Peru, off near the Galapagos. Notice, if you go back three million years ago, the water in all these places was warm. It looks as if there was a permanent El Nino, the eastern, meaning the Eastern Pacific was as warm as the West up to this time. Now, when I show this to my GFDL colleagues, after I've presented some of these results, they immediately question the data. <laughs> Why do I believe these people? Uh, one problem here is they've taken care to go to the cold regions and they've established the cold regions where it's a lot warmer three million years ago. They haven't gone to the warm regions, the Western Equatorial Pacific. Maybe it has, it has the same curve. That's what the, most of the IPCC models would tell you, that you'd actually just go to a higher curve. So I want to conclude in saying we have definite puzzles. Uh, that's sort of a summary of what I have to say. And the recommendations is that we really need models that bridge A and B. And I would submit that such a model is seen realistically when not only it simulates the climate of today, I mean, that's the justification for confidence in IBC models, but it also has to, this is unnecessary W here, it has to pass climate, especially in response to Milankovitch. And uh, earlier today we had discussions of what happened with the last glacial maximum. Or, the problem is the, the Milankovitch forcing is quite complicated, last glacial maximum. The precession is changing, the obliquity is changing, eccentricity. I think it would be better to focus on some frequency, what's common to all the last glacial maximums, or, or to common to all the 40k peaks and so on. There's a wealth of detail I don't have time to go into, but my main hope is to persuade more people that the paleo record needs to be taken seriously. That it's a kind of worms, because of these contradictory papers, that unfortunately appear in science and nature. But there's nothing wrong with contradictory papers in science, but I don't think people should wash their linen in public. I mean, they should publish those in the quaternary journal or something or other, uh, and not in nature and science. Uh, the New York Times then picks up, it, it makes all of us look silly. You know, somebody says it was El Nino, somebody says La Nina. Uh, I feel there's a need for far more interaction between the paleo people, the modeling community. and. Anybody who wants to develop an economic model that gives high confidence to our predictions of how El Nino will change or what shutting down the radiomal circulation will do, whatever, uh, I wouldn't pay a penny for, <laughs> for, for, for such an economic model. You have to assume the uncertainties of these models are just enormous. We've overlooked all sorts of mechanisms. Carl pointed out I was just discussing one more. There could be a whole host of other things. Uh, at, at some point in this meeting, I hope we'll have a chance to discuss uh, the sociology or the politics of science, but I feel there's, there simply isn't enough encouragement given to what I would call small science. 
that, that, that there's a dominance of big science, uh, developing large, complicated models. Then the data sets get put on web and we tie up everybody analyzing those data sets. So, uh, we, we should instruct 20, 30% of the people never to get involved with IPCC <laughs> to do their own thing. But I, I feel it's a serious concern that we're not exploring enough possibilities. We're putting all our eggs in one basket. And the only checks we really have are the paleo data. It, it's not a trivial matter getting involved in the paleo record, but we have no choice. I'll leave it as that. Mm -hmm.